Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Unproduced Table Read here on the Popcorn Talk Network. Now, I know we've been on a brief hiatus, but it's for a very good reason. I have two amazing writers and Pixar alum here in studio. We're going to have an amazing conversation that I cannot wait for, but for now, stay tuned. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Unproduced Table Read here on the Popcorn Talk Network. You are hearing More Than a Feeling, which was used in the trailer for Inside Out, which you both worked on yes. over at Pixar. Mm -hmm. That's right, guys. I have Meg LaFove and Lorian McKenna here in studio, both Pixar alum, both wonderful writers, both wonderful people, and we are going to talk all about story and writing and nerdy screenwriter stuff that I know all of you listening are so excited to hear about. Lorian and Meg, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. This is great. It's great. I'm so excited. Before we dive into the interview, though, guys, I know we've been on a brief hiatus, and it's because I have some updates. Um, it's all good stuff, but a lot of my cast has booked amazing work. Um, we got a couple series regular bookings and just good stuff that I can't really talk about. You're going to be hearing that a lot today, is we've got exciting stuff that we can't actually talk about. But because of that, we're recasting the show and working on getting new actors in studio. So just know that I have some amazing scripts booked down the line. Um, we're working a lot more on additional female scripts and more diversity and inclusion in the work we're pushing down the road and I'm just really excited about what we've got so keep your eyes on the podcast because we do have amazing stuff coming and we appreciate your patience as we do some restructuring with the show I also want to let you guys know about some exciting news if you've been following the Academy lately um, the nickel announcement just dropped so we have our nickel finalists and Gabriel Mizrahi UTR alum is one of the winners this year you guys remember he's actually our first episode we read a um, pilot by him called accelerator that's really wonderful and I just know he's gonna be running Hollywood in about five years so, Gabriel, congratulations. And UTR alum Maria Sten, who is one of those infuriatingly talented people that kind of does everything, um, she wrote The Courier, which was our seventh episode, and she just booked a series regular as an actress on the DCEU's new Swamp Thing show. So, a lot of exciting stuff from our alumni. But, of course, we're here with Megan Lorian. As I mentioned, guys, Meg and Lorian both met at Pixar, but have done a lot on their own. Um, Meg originally worked as a producer and president of Egg Pictures, which was Jodie Foster's film company. There, she developed a number of films, some of which have won Golden Globes. We'll talk all about that. You probably know her for her writing on Inside Out, which, of course, is an Oscar-nominated screenplay. She also wrote Pixar's Golden Globe, nominated The Good Dinosaur, and is billed on Captain Marvel, which I know we can't talk too much about, but I'm sure you DCEU fans, or Marvel fans, rather are salivating when you hear that. And Lorian also has studio experience at Pixar. We're so excited. She worked on story development for Ratatouille, Up, Brave, Inside Out, and The Good Dinosaur. She also story consulted for Real FX Animation and um, worked at, let's see... Paramount. And, and Paramount as well. Thank you so much. And you're from Ohio, which I am as well. She's from Ohio. I'm you're from, from Ohio. Ohio. <laughs> I'm not doing my job very well, guys. Um, but I'm from I Cleveland. I was like, you're from Ohio. Dude, no, I'm from California. <laughs> Surprise. Um, but guys, it is such an honor to have you both in studio. Thanks for being here. I'm going to start with a question that I actually stole from Ileana Douglas, who hosts the show here. She always asks her guests, what's the first movie you can remember seeing in the theater? Well, mine is utterly inappropriate. That's Because I fine. think I was like six or seven. <laughs> and my father was a, he was a, a pilot, so he took us to see the great Waldo Pepper. <laughs> And there's a scene in it where Susan Sarandon is out on the biplane wing and she falls off, <laughs> which is burned into my mind. That nice. scene was not appropriate, but good mm. taste. My dad had good taste, I guess. Yeah, and um, my first movie experience was um, my father and my stepmom took me to the drive-in and they thought I was asleep in the back and I wasn't and I watched Carrie when I was six years old. Oh no. You win. I was so uh, lots of scary images for that. Uh, so that did not inspire me to be in the movie. No. <laughs> I, am, I want to meet your parents. I love that they took you to see Carrie when you were six years old. They, they thought I was asleep. <laughs> Fair you enough. Know. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So another question I have sort of related to that is, what do you think is the first film you saw that really kind of inspired you creatively and sort of made you think like, wow, this is something I might want to do? Um, if there is one. I know sometimes yeah, it's I mean, hard I to loved, pinpoint. I loved movies. I think the one, which is kind of strange, but that I think I thought, oh, who's, who's writing this? How, how, how is this happening? Um, was when I saw Sophie's Choice. Mm. Um, just in terms of the breadth and depth of the human experience that you could put onto film, and um, I just I just was floored by it. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, my experience was much more in theater. 
I we weren't allowed to watch TV, and so uh, so the rare movie I was I went to sort of terrified me. Snow White was as, as terrifying to me as um, Carrie because <laughs> I wasn't exposed to media in any way. So for me, it was the theater, and so. Um, and I wanted to be an actress. I didn't want to be a writer because it was about the storytelling. Mm. I didn't like the rehearsal part or the um, memorizing my lines or like the process of being an actor, like acting like a cat and doing all those things. For me, it was about being on stage and telling the story. And then obviously the applause <laughs> part was awesome. <laughs> so can you think of any shows that you feel like you saw that really sort of inspired you creatively or more just the general theater going experience, do you think? Yeah, I think I just unhooked my mic. We can fix that. No okay. worries. Um, <laughs> Which is a sort of thing for me. She does that every time. It's all right. It's um, let's see. Um, okay. I mean, I have a terrible memory, so this one's hard. But m- most recently for me, it's Marvelous Mrs. Maisel mm. and Glow. And I watch those shows and I think, I, I wish I'd written those. Yeah. Like, Or I want to be a part of that and telling stories like those. Um, yeah, that's a great answer. I mean, those are two wonderful shows. I love both of those. I got to interview Carly Flayhaven and Liz Mensch earlier this year, who created Glow, and they're wonderful. Um, okay, so a question I always have for screenwriters is: when you started to get interested in the art of storytelling and building narrative, did you feel like you wanted to do it for the screen immediately, or was that something that you sort of discovered as you developed as a writer? Yeah, I started writing short stories and thinking of myself as a novelist, but then the visual storytelling of the film really appealed to me in that how much storytelling happens through behavior Mm. um, and and how you have to tell it visually. When I was a producer, I worked with a wonderful writer from the stage, but when we turned the script in, Jody said, why is everybody talking about what I should be seeing? Hmm. And so I went back to the writer and I said, listen, just as a writing exercise to get your brain to understand the difference, try it as a silent film, write the whole thing as a silent film, so that your brain has to start to learn how to tell me everything I need to know, but just visually. And that really taught me something as well, to read what really she could uh, translate visually um, and what really couldn't be translated visually. We had to go back to the spoken word. So that, I mean, I love that. That's I'm, I'm a story junkie. I love film. I love how it um, communicates. And it's funny because as a writer, sometimes people think you just write the dialogue. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, somebody in the piano wrote the moment that he puts her hand on the chopping block and they wrote what's happening emotionally. Like, that's all written, mm. right? Um, so I believe as a writer, it's especially in film, uh, very important, if not the most important thing to know how to write visually. Mm-hmm. Do you feel the same way, Lorian? Now I do, yes. I mean, I studied playwriting and tried very hard to only write dialogue, mm-hmm. right? Thinking that everything was dialogue. I, I refused to write stage directions. I was young. I had opinions. <laughs> um, and then it wasn't until I got to Pixar and I would sit in the edit room and I started to understand what you're talking about, that there's so much that can be conveyed visually that needs to be told that way. And so that's where I started to learn uh, how to write for screen Mm -hmm. and still am, still do, right? I will always, when I get scared or I feel vulnerable, I'll go to dialogue because that's sort of my safety net. Mm -hmm. So I have to figure out how to pull back from that. Well, let's transition into Pixar then. You guys are talking about the visual language of film. And as a guess, I would assume that that's an even higher demand in an animated medium. Is that true or do you feel like the necessity for really deep visual storytelling is equal in a live action film as it would be in an animated film? Well, I think it's equal. It's just it's a very different process because we, as a as a writer, I'm there with I'm involved as the storyboards are coming in. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely a process between the storyboard artist and the director. But I'm in the room to raise my hand and throw out ideas or kind of be, be looking at the whole movie, not just this sequence, to keep that context. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's a very collaborative experience with the storyboard artists who are storytellers. I mean, they are amazing people and so talented. Um, so it's very, you're, you're just a different process in terms of having to know visually how to convey this. And, you know, animation is faster, in my opinion. Like, you have to write very succinctly. Your scripts are shorter and um, and be funny and, 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 you know, there's a it's a very high bar. Um, so, and I agree with you about the edit room. Any every writer who wants to write for film or TV should get an edit room to see because the editor is the final rewrite. That's true. There's so much storytelling that happens in editing that people don't always acknowledge. Right, and just to understand what you're writing for, you know, you're writing for the actor, you're writing because it's going to go into edit. Somebody's got to. And it's funny when we first when I first started at Pixar, <laughs> my husband was like, "Meg, nobody wants to animate." Miles going like this, and I was like, "Oh, you're right." Oh my God. <laughs> 
<laughs> I get that the instinct the the instinct for dialogue might need to be pulled back a little bit when you're working in animation. <laughs> well, just it's it's such a physical medium in terms mm-hmm. of that, yeah. Definitely. So you two met at Pixar, is that right? That's right. Okay, great. So can you give me sort of a timeline? When did you guys first meet? What was your early... You don't need to give years if you want to keep that anonymous. That's right. <laughs> but I'd love to hear sort of about your early working relationship, because now you guys are working more directly as writing partners, but it wasn't always that way. So I was the story manager on Inside Out. So that means I was in charge of managing the story team and... Um, facilitating they would get script pages and direction from the director and then they would draw the sequences right mm-hmm. so sort of making sure that was a cohesive unit and um, really working and so we Meg joined the team as right soon after I started on the film and uh, so it was exciting for me because she had never written for animation before <laughs> it was crazy <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I got to um, sort of zoom out and what the process is and sort of help her through that yeah. to some extent. Yeah, I don't think I would have made it without Lorian. I mean, the very first day, I, they put me in a room with like 12 people, and it was all the different departments. And I was like, what are we doing? Yeah. And she's like, well, they're their coordinators, and they need to know, like, they're going to do pages here and there and there, and it's going to move here. And then we went down to a cupcake truck that was for Pete Doctor's birthday, and there were 100 people out there. And I was like, who are all these people? I'm sure. And she was like, it was you or Josh said, well, that, this is the crew. And I was like, for what? Because, you know, from features, I was like, we don't have a script. Right. And they were like, for the movie. And I was like, what are they doing? Waiting for you. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> that wasn't me. It I wasn't never you, said, said that. Josh. No. <laughs> um, but it was true because I was coming in and, you know, you're at Pixar, you're constantly remaking the film. You put it up in boards, you go see it, you go into the brain trust room, you get notes from these incredible filmmakers, and then you start again. And what I always like to emphasize at Pixar, after you've boarded the movie, they've edited everything, you've watched the movie, when we, after we get notes, we go back and card the movie. We don't go back to a script. You go back and you re-card the movie, you re, you go all the way back down to the base of the movie and rebuild it. Wow. Which is why I think one of the reasons they're so good, because a lot of writers fall into the trap of thinking a rewrite is, well, I open my document back up and I start noodling on the top. Well, that's just, you're just taking care of the symptoms. You're not really Mm. getting down to the disease. So you'll just get new symptoms. So Pixar really does, in those brain trusts, they take it apart, and you have to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. And then your job is, okay, given all these pieces, and maybe they threw out ideas of how to rebuild it, but really it's about the director now going back into a room and saying, okay, this is what I like and what I feel strongly about, and let's let's rebuild the movie from there. So when you say recard, you probably mean like index cards, right? And getting to wall. a board and yeah. yeah, that's so valuable for our listeners. I think so many people under undervalue the importance of outlining because I think especially in screenwriting that's such an essential component to good storytelling. Would you agree? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, and everybody's process is different, yeah. right? I mean, um Sometimes I do a puke draft. Like, mm-hmm. literally, we were just talking yeah. about something we're working on now, and I was like, you know, let's just puke it out. Yeah. Let's just, like, it doesn't have to be good. We just put the questions we have, and as we're writing, we can be like, oh, this does not work at all, but let's just keep going. Right. Just to get it out as, like, the clay to now work from. And then often from there, I go to cards mm-hmm. or to outlining. Once I've started to let the writers, or, I mean, sorry, the actors and the characters talk. Yeah. A really successful uh, meeting, well, the room will be a mess. Right, so you go in, there's a blank board, you're putting up act one, two, and three, and cards, and all the beats, and then the director and the writer get up there and sort of take this one down and throw it on the ground and write a new one, and moving things around, and then repitching it and repitching it. So at the end of the day, there's colored index cards all over and scraps of paper, and that's how you know it was a like a really productive, successful meeting. I worked meeting. at Disney Animation, too, and both there and with Pete Docter, and at Pixar, he'd <laughs> be like, don't move the cards on the floor. It shows that we did something today. <laughs> yeah. Like, I want to see the cards, you know, yeah. growing on the floor, because yeah. it means you're really being daring and just pulling it down and putting it back up and pulling it and down. And you might need that card. And you might again, need card, to put it yeah. back <laughs> to see if it... Right. Now it works somewhere. And the executives yeah. who don't understand anything about creativity need to see something physical <laughs> to justify. Right? Well, that's the thing about Pixar <laughs> they do and, and Disney Animation yeah. is um, there really aren't executives. Wow. Um, it really is just other filmmakers hmm. who have their own room full of cards on the floor. So uh, it's really just filmmakers helping mm-hmm. filmmakers at both uh, Pixar and Disney Animation. Do you think that culture is what's fostered such a successful run of films? Because both Disney, but I would say especially Pixar, it does feel like every movie that comes out is sort of a masterwork of 
clean, emotionally driven, beautiful storytelling. And I'm wondering, do you think it's the lack of executive interference that's helping make that happen? I mean, it could be. I mean, I've worked in the business a long time and I've had good executives and I've had bad executives. I mean, there are executives out there who are master storytellers themselves and Mm -hmm. you're so lucky because they know the churn that it's going to go through in marketing, like you really, really want those people on your team and they're super smart. But there, you can also get ones that they're doing this more to prove why they need to be in the room versus for the story or they're shadow artists trying to write through you or you get all different kinds. Um, so I couldn't say for sure it's only because of executives. Um, but it certainly is a great privilege to be able to have Andrew Stanton and, uh, and Brad Bird <laughs> give you notes. Right. I mean, that I just love to sit in brain trust and just listen to Andrew Stanton. I'm always like this. Like, what is he going to say? Because <laughs> yeah. he's so smart. And just to hear his brain work, I would just try to soak it up like a sponge because it was such a privilege. Yeah, I'm sure. So, Lauren, you got your MFA in playwriting, yes. Did. did you start at Pixar pretty soon after that? or No, uh, five years later. Okay. I would just have to imagine that there would be a bit of mental gymnastics coming from a playwriting background diving into animation. Can you sort of explain what that transition was like? So I was an adjunct professor at St. Mary's College and I was teaching writing and theater to freshmen. And I had my own theater company and I was writing my own work and producing other people's work. And um, I was in a play, I was acting, I was still thinking that was going to happen. I was a really amazing community theater actress. <laughs> I mean, pretty stunning. There's something to be said about um, that, though, right? Yeah, it's a thing. Um, and a woman I was in a play with worked in consumer products at Pixar, and she said, we, you know, there's an opportunity, there's an intern that's uh, going on a six-week leave, and we need a temp for her on Fridays. Why don't you come in and do that? And I was like, oh, no. I'm a playwriting professor. That is not for me. Uh, and then I got home, and my husband, who loves animation, one of our first dates was a sick and twisted animation festival. Uh, he's like, no, but maybe you should, maybe you should say yes to that. So I denied it, and then I answered the call, and uh, I uh, went and I did this temp for an intern thing on Fridays, and I rolled posters and I got to read the galleys for the Art of Cars, and just did a lot of odds and ends, and I just fell in love with the atmosphere there because it felt a lot like theater. It was really mm-hmm. collaborative. There was this really supportive community, and. Um, And then I got a job on Ratatouille. You know, I decided to do that. And um, for me, it was leaving teaching behind, which was tough, but um, I got to then be in the position of being a a student, right? Mm -hmm. I was learning this whole new uh, medium and all these new people who love film. I mean, Mm -hmm. they love film at storytelling at Pixar, which was so great. And being in the story department and just working with writers and story artists and being a part of that was so thrilling and exciting. So I didn't feel like I was leaving anything behind. And because I was learning, like Up was the first movie I was on, The whole, you know, I was on for three and a half years. And so being very early on and then all the way through it and just learning and watching Pete like change something like three frames forward and it magically fixed the sequence. And sort of, for me, it was such an education. It was so exciting. So that that transition didn't feel negative in any way Mm because I was learning so much and it was so exciting. Mm. That's a great community too. Mm. Um, So I want to talk about, I know this is a big question so we can answer it as briefly as we want, but sort of like conception of Pixar film to delivery of Pixar film because I think the process is so atypical compared to what I understand about filmmaking. So like Pete Doctor gets the idea for Inside Out. What does that look like from genesis to delivery? You've worked in more departments that you would so I think, so Pete came up with that idea while we were still on Up. Um, I think it had to do with his um, daughter and her sort of turning 13 and all those emotions. And I think he just really wanted to explore that. Mm-hmm. And um, so he, he went into development on that project. They talked to psychiatrists. They had a writer working on an early draft. Um, I, I was off making Brave, so I wasn't a part of that. <laughs> but, um, and then they... Uh, brought on story artists and start drawing and it's sort of it it's hard to describe it's just a lot of trial and error until something feels right I mean that's if Pixar's one of Pixar's mottos is fail fast Mm. the expectation is that if you are out on a creative edge you will fail you actually want that to happen so that you can see oh that didn't work that was a great idea but in practice it didn't work so let's what's the next thing they're always pushing 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 which is another reason i think their movies are so good yeah um and then in, you're in the room developing it on cards and you're writing scenes and the scenes are moving out to the storyboard artists um 
and when I come on to Inside Out, just in terms of the timing, it wasn't like I've seen development there where people are literally going away and writing a script, like in features. But that is, wasn't my experience in either movie. We were literally drawing as I was writing, and we were going very fast. So um, you're then you're going into the storyboard, and they're presenting. They go and I mean, they can draw a thousand drawings for one sequence. Um, so you have to have great respect for all the hours they've put in when you raise your hand to make a note. Um, and uh, then those boards go into edit. And then what I always found fascinating as a writer is in edit, they've got Cintiq. So they're literally able, as you're watching it go by, to go, wait, pause that. We need a close up there. Draw it. Yeah. Send it in. There it is. So wow. they're, again, that storyboarding process, the writing process we is also. record dialogue right there in the edit suite. You know, we right. bring it. Pete would do it. I remember one scene on Up, Pete did the voices for every single character. <laughs> and it's fun because, you know, that is a very big part that I learned as a writer of the recording those voices, especially when you have Amy Poehler and Bill Hader and, I mean, all these incredible actors and writers in their own right. So they are improv right? And one day Bill Hader just came in to churn it up with us and walk around the room and, you know, what a privilege that is to watch their brain start, to how they are coming at the character and how they're, you know, it was it was so fun. I mean, I have to I'm say, sure. it was fun, and they're very generous and laugh at your bad jokes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Amy Poehler was so nice. She's such she'd a make a joke laugh. and she'd be like, "Oh!" And you'd be thinking, "That's not funny. You're so nice." This UCB trained improviser. Yeah, yeah she's I will great. say she's a very generous laugh, oh, though, which so I generous. love about her. You know, I and it in fact was very way. easy to write Joy when she was cast because her joy is very much about everybody mm -hmm. right it wasn't like i'm happy it was like we're happy yeah. it, so that's a very likable warm joy infectious yeah infectious yeah that's really cool and the process at pixar uh is you know fail often fail fast it's really creative you're drawing you're going but at the same time there are sequences in production mm -hmm. that are being animated as you're rewriting other parts of the movie so you do start to get boxed in a little bit. So the choices have to be, you, know, you have to come up with even more creative ways to solve the problems in the places where you still can. And I think those fences actually um, start to force you to make really uh, strong choices, mm -hmm. that it's a good thing. So there's all this freedom up front, and then you have to start to be very strategic. And the I think fun it's thing, too, is people are character designing at the same time. So like on uh, The Good Dinosaur, we were going so fast, and then we knew we had, were going to have uh, cattle rustlers. But I'm I'm doing a whole different part of the movie, and all of a sudden these character designs come in with the ca with the cattle rustlers with mullets, and I was like, well, okay. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> here we go. But yeah. you know that starts to tell me who they think the so mm -hmm. it's this big process going. Every department is starting to really affect the movie at a very early stage. There's mm -hmm. just an incredible amount of trust. You know, I think there's you know 300 people at some point working on the movie, and sort of. How the how all that information is communicated? You just really have to trust that what you're working on is going to make it into the movie or mm -hmm. going to inform some part of the process. And they really want everybody pushing to their limit in terms of uh, their own creativity in every department. So, as a writer, you often feel like you're walking around with your underpants on because it's a vulnerable experience to put right. all of that on the page. But at Pixar, it's like 300 people doing that. You know, at <laughs> every department, the writers, the the the, the people doing the everything, they are all pushing themselves. So you, you, it's, it's kind of a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Pixar is such an exceptional animation studio because it doesn't, I think all of their movies are obviously catered towards children, but are also very clearly written with a, an adult demographic in mind. Not in the sense of even joke telling, but in this, I think the sense of emotionally rich storytelling. Um, is that something that's deliberately considered when developing movies or is that something that just sort of happens, do you think? Because I don't think it happens in other studios. Um, I I never sat in a room where people we were writing to a kid. You're always writing the best story, and and the only rule when you went into those brain trusts was, is this the best story? And so that in a, that tiny little question holds all the depth that you're talking about, because mm. the best story does root down into the human condition and what it's like to be human, and all of the deep rich soil that comes from that, um, and it has to be funny and entertaining, of course, but really the, the, the root of it is make, when you go into that brain trust or that screening, do they feel something, mm. right? Do they understand the deep motivation of the characters and why they're doing it? And so, you know, when we were carting Inside Out, I remember thinking, and actually I think I even talked to Pete about it, I was like, 
is John Lasseter going to let us cry at the end of this movie? Because it's about, ultimately it's about sadness and accepting sadness. So we have to have a scene at the end where you cry and the audience has to go through what we're actually thematically putting forward. Right. And we pitched it to John and he was listening and Pete was pitching it and he got to the part over here on the cards because it went all the way around the wall at that. And John sat there and he was like, I want to cry right there. And I was like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> we can do it. Um, so it's just the, the deep understanding of all the other filmmakers of what the goal is, and the goal is that great story. Yeah, the mechanics. Well, just, you know, digging into your personal stuff. We spent days and days talking about, okay, we have to convince people that sadness is not a good thing because that's Joy's emotional point of view. How do we do that? And we talked about what it's, you know, all the times that we were, you know, what the worst thing that sadness could do and cry in school right would be mm -hmm. one of the worst things but you're always digging into your own life and as far as the humor it's the same if we thought it was funny it was funny there right. was no machinations to like appeal oh our adults gonna think this is funny or this joke is for the grandparents it was just did we think it was funny mm -hmm. did and the it, filmmakers it, think it, it was did funny? come up will kids understand the emotions and is that a concept that kids will get and i'm pretty sure pete screened it to some young kids and realized they get it better mm -hmm. than adults wow yeah, they're more in touch, probably. They're they haven't been jaded. Yeah. yeah. That's really, really fascinating. It's I think, as someone who grew up on Pixar, it's, like, such a privilege for me to just get a little sneak peek into, like, I think what's such a beautiful studio. So thank you for the work that you guys produce there. It's, it's such an important part of my development, even as a writer, you know, just... It's uh, great stuff you guys did over there. Lorraine, I want to focus a little bit on you. So much of your bio talks about your work as a story consultant. What does that mean, like, for anyone who hears <laughs> I, that? I would love to know. <laughs> um, I, uh, there's a couple different ways. Uh, one is that uh, I go into a studio and they ask me to work with a director on their film, sort of helping them find the emotional core of it. Um, a lot of stuff I learned from Meg. Um, reading scripts and giving notes, a lot of it is about structure and mm -hmm. emotional um, resonance. I work with writers individually. Um, yeah. That's, Great. That's giving notes. Yeah. Basically giving notes. It's a lot of giving notes, but it's how you give notes, right? And there's a different audience each time at a studio level. They're looking for something else. For an individual writer, it's a it's more coaching. Yeah. Um, with somebody who's a better writer than I am, it's always a challenge, like how you ask the questions, mm. you know, so how you give advice or poke at something. Well, as someone who is taught, and I think the art of giving notes is such an important part of the writer's journey, can you talk about giving good notes and receiving notes? Because I think a lot of writers struggle with receiving notes. Yeah, receiving notes is really, really hard because you take it really personally, right. no matter what. Yeah, I think of it as um, the prim most primitive part of your brain really does believe that you are being killed. <laughs> and all of the chemical things happen in your wow. brain that, that, I mean, physically in your brain, some part of you is like, we are going to die. Mm. Um, and it just takes a great ability to kind of put that to the side and stay open. And that's why I always record notes or have somebody writing it down for me because you don't hear half of them. I black out in yeah. the middle. Because like, mm -hmm. your brain is in going through this big chemical shift, right? And you need to go back later and read them again and, and be less defensive. And, and I mean, I used to give notes for a living as a producer and then I flipped and it still didn't matter. I went to the Sundance Lab as a writer with an old partner, John Morgan, and we walked out of the first session and he looked at me and he goes you look like a clubbed baby seal and I was like I know <laughs> it just doesn't matter it's just part of the process right because you did get vulnerable and put that on the page and it does feel like you're in your underwear and yeah but really people are just telling you what they didn't get they didn't get whatever you believe is in the story they didn't receive it mm. it's not that it's good or bad or they didn't get it and mm -hmm. then the other thing I always warn people about notes is especially when they're telling you how to fix it they're telling you more about themselves sometimes than your project, meaning how to fix it is just another way to illuminate the problem underneath. Mm. You have to be very careful because you could fix it that way, but that does that root all the way back to the emotional core and the theme that you're trying to get to? Um, so you have to kind of listen to the note under the note, or like when we were on Inside Out and there was a scene that I knew was Pete Doctor's, one of his favorite scenes, and yet it kept getting noted in the brain trust. And the normal thing would be, well, we have to change it. And I was intuitively like, I don't think the note is landing there. I think it's because of something earlier. I think we haven't earned that scene. Mm. And if we can ch earn it, then it'll be fine. Like, you have to be careful, right? Like, I always ask people, what, what is the one scene in here that if I took it out, it's no longer yours? 
And I'm always surprised by yeah. what they say. That's a really, I think, valuable question because I think with receiving notes, tell me if you agree or disagree, but at a certain point, you can't take every note because if you take everyone else's note, the thing is no longer your thing. Yeah. It's helpful to get notes if somebody says, this right here, like I didn't feel it or I don't understand, so that you can look at that moment and see, like you said earlier, is there something I'm missing earlier or later? Um, instead of taking all the notes, it's, it's listening to what resonates with you too, what you feel the truth in, and if you look at all the notes, right? Or if you get really, really mad. Mm -hmm. Wow, they just hit on something that you are blocking right. and not wanting. Or I, I, I always sometimes I look and I was, I was doing a script for Australia and this indigenous filmmaker and all of the characters were really well drawn, and then there was this father character and he was really flat and cliche and. And normally you'd be like, well, cut that. You have to work on that character or cut him. He's not even involved in the story. And then I realized in talking to him about who he is and what he loved about the script and where did the script come from, I just asked a lot of questions. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, it's all about the father. Mm. Meaning the, his brain had been so afraid to go over and deal with that that it made it flat. Mm. So I never walk into a note session and tell them what I think. Not, I have no idea. This is your dream. I have to decode the dream with you wow. in order to know what you're doing. Now, that's at that level. Once you mm -hmm. get into the studio and someone's paying you money, and there's all kinds of other layers coming into that no process. Right. How many times can we put Coca-Cola in scene eight? <laughs> I've never of. gotten that note. I've never gotten <laughs> Not that yet. note. Not, Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, that's really beautiful advice. I appreciate you guys sharing that. Um, Lorian, you have a podcast called I Failed So What? Um, yes, we had one season. We're no that's longer doing it anymore. Well, um, I, I, wanted to, I think failures come up, and it's an important component to being a writer. So I want to talk about, I mean, it was even in the motto of Pixar, how do we deal with failure as a writer? What does failure mean, and how can we grow? Well, I think in the podcast, uh, which I made with Dara Harris, who's a brilliant psychiatrist and works with elite athletes and sports performance, and Maytel Gaboa, who runs Emmett Comics, um, we were really trying to investigate how failure and shame are tied together. And what was really interesting, we talked to women creators in the industry, including Meg, and everybody's experience of failure is so different because their experience of shame is so different and what that means. And for me, personally, um, you know, failure is a human experience, right? We all have it. And I think it's how we manage it in this industry. Because um, you could be, you could have all the awards and have projects set up and everyone loves you and it feels really great. And then the wheel turns and suddenly no one's calling you back and you have no money. And, and, and so um, for me, in order to navigate that, because it always will turn, is to find your tribe is to find the people and the community that's going to support you in those low moments. And that comes down to um, telling the truth about how you feel about failure when it happens. So in, in the world, and I think especially in this industry, we tend to hide those moments of failure, right? Like, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Everything's great. Hey, what's going on, right? Because we don't want anyone to know that we're not on the top of our game. But I think if you can find those people that you can trust, so that when those low moments happen, you can turn to them and they can reflect back to you who you really are, mm. not being defined by the success or the failure moments. Because that's those are just outside things that are happening as you navigate as a person. Um, and so the sort of it's hard. Failure sucks. Uh, it hurt. It feels very personal. And sometimes you have no money. And you know, I I've had my huge up and down struggle since I've been in LA for four years. You know, we. I had to sell our art collection, right? I had a show not go through and we had no money and I have a house and a daughter and a husband and so we sold our art collection to make to make it through to this next place, which is not awesome and means something when I admit that, mm -hmm. right? It means something to people listening. If there's an executive listening, it means, oh, maybe, maybe her narrative isn't like 100% awesome, but it's the truth. Right. So for me, um, being able to be vulnerable about that with everyone who's listening, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, that um, is the work of a storyteller, too, right? Yeah. You're, you're asking the audience to have a catharsis with your story. You are going to probably have a catharsis creating that story. I mean, you, you're asking them to be vulnerable. You have to be vulnerable to write, to write at all. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, failure is part of the process and I've met very talented writers who are not writers now because they could not deal with the churn they could not in their ego or their whatever soul deal with the feedback that constantly is coming and it's hard but sometimes I will just ask that little part of me that's starting to freak out 
just just take a chair and wait because I'm not going to actually die. Right. It, it thinks I'm going to die, but watch, I'm not. And it's a matter of fact, if I push through this failure and I push through to the next level, I live. Mm-hmm. You know, I worked with kids at UCLA and I started to, in AFI in different places, and I started to realize that often the pattern that they were stuck in, that they were trying to work out in their script was the pattern they were going to get stuck in themselves right now with the script, if that makes sense. So, for example, I had a young uh, guy writing a short film about uh, two brothers. One was clearly the father figure and the younger brother realizing, oh, my brother is corrupt. And at the end of the little short film, he uh, climbed out the window and drove away. And I was like, well, (laughs) maybe (laughs) he has to confront the brother. And he just wasn't emotionally ready to do that note. And then I found out that his dad financed the short film. Wow. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's all kinds of reasons that things are not bubbling up, or it's really, you have to be very brave. And, you know, I, working with Pete Doctor, who is a genius, I, one of the reasons of the many that he's a genius is because he, he just drops down into that stuff. Mm. He's so honest as if he didn't create a filter that the rest of us have. Wow. He's just so honest about his life and the authenticity that he brings every day to the table um, was always just stunning. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that is what the work everybody's doing. And it also helped to go to Pixar and see that even these am- a massive, massive genius storytellers, and I don't use that word a lot, um, uh, they fail. Yeah. And they do screenings that don't work. And they have sequences that you're like, I have no idea what that is, right? right. Because that is the process, right. and they get vulnerable too. Mm-hmm. Like nobody get nobody, nobody gets by without doing it. So sometimes when people, young writers, come to me and they're like, Oh my God, my first draft sucked, and nobody liked it. I'm just like, Welcome. Yeah, yeah. you've made you've arrived. Welcome yeah. to being a writer. And that was another goal of the podcast was to bring on women who are very successful, who have been nominated for Academy Awards and have directed amazing episodes of TV and films to talk about failure so that the young emerging artists and other people would understand that while it looks like you've made it or you're successful, there's struggle all the time, right? There's no end. Right. There's no prize when you win at the end. If there is, though, let me know, and I will <laughs> try to prizes get along that. The way. There's prizes along this the way. This is a but prize. The, yes. Yeah. But, there right is now. No, but there is no, like... You're done, and There's you never no, have done. to worry ever again. You've but, made it. No, every right? time you go back to the blank page and hope that it'll work. The fear sets back in, right? You've got to push yeah. through. I want to ask about this, too, because when you talk about your tribe, it's like, I get it. I work in this industry. I've experienced all of this. But for people who are outside of this tribe, maybe our family or our friends who don't get it, how have you managed to deal and cope with that? Because so many writers are afraid to take that leap based on the judgment of other people. Well, it's funny. Um, I left my job at Pixar in 2014, and I moved to LA, and I was at Paramount for a year. And um, you know, I've been a writer ever since, like full time. I'm a writer. I'm doing it. But my sister sometimes will just ask me, "But you don't have a job. What are you doing? And how are you making a living?" It's it's mystifying. You know, the the gig sort of. Oh, I I closed the deal. I made all this money, but the show didn't go, so nobody gets to see it, right? It's so. I, I just try to reassure them that, and they have to trust me that, you know, and I can't worry about their judgment of right. me. Yeah, you I, have to, I, yeah, you have to own your own life. Yeah. You know, um, often people write characters in, in the first draft, including myself, who they're very reactive to all the things happening to them. And I think that's because really we believe that our life is happening to us, but that is not true. You create your life every day with every choice that you're making. Did you sit down and write today? That was your choice. Right? You're, you have to own your life and create your own life. And if you're doing that, yes, you might get people coming at you. When I wanted to, I set Pixar as a little beacon that I wanted to write there, and people thought it was crazy. First of all, I was a producer, and I hadn't really made my transition yet. And Pixar very rarely hires writers. And, and I was like, I know, but it's mine. Hmm. It's a very personal thing of my beacon and what I'm going to drive towards. And I made sure that that beacon was something that both thrilled me and scared me because yeah. it was going to push me a little further than I was um, or a lot further. Uh, so, you know, don't use other people's opinions as an excuse for your life choices. Mm. You know, when I wanted to move out to L.A. and I was in New York, I literally said to my stepmother, I have this bookcase. 
and I love it. And I don't, how would I move it? <laughs> I can't, <laughs> she was literally like, you're not gonna make a choice in your life that you want because of a bookcase. And I was like, oh right, geez, what am I? <laughs> like it was like, whoa. And I, that to me, that bookcase is like a symbol now. Like, okay, is this just another bookcase? Cause I'm actually afraid. I'm actually just afraid. Wow. And the answer is, yeah, you're afraid. Mm -hmm. Be afraid and then do it anyways. And I guess allowing ourselves to enter that space probably makes for much richer writing. If we're talking about the importance of vulnerability, if we're not letting ourselves make those dives, we're never going to even write good stuff. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so you guys have developed into a writing partnership. I know there's some stuff that you can't really talk about, which is a good problem to have, but I want to talk about the process because I'm always fascinated by writing partnerships. How do you write together? I want to even know like the tactile, like do you guys use write or duet? Are you writing on a Google Doc? How does your no. process look? Uh, we did have a Google Doc, didn't we? I made one and then that was that. <laughs> um, I think we, we share a lot of ideas in email, okay. email threads, which probably isn't, maybe we should reevaluate that. You know, it's like, the, where's that one email thread do with do that, that one idea? Scott Nudsetter <laughs> and um, Weber and Nudsetter who wrote The Disaster Artist and The Spectacular Now, I also know use emails. So yeah. they're a proven writing partnership who does this Well, because thing. it's easy because you're like, it's 10 o'clock and you're like, hey, what about this idea? And then yeah. it just, it can, it's just constantly there. I don't know. And yeah. then we get into to a, like for an outline, if we're doing an outline, we get into the document. We start talking to each other in the document, like Meg um, mentioned. Yeah, and then before. we also all like we always are going back to the dry erase board um, and re it's it's carding, but on a dry erase board where I have this chart that I make and I just write out the movie in the big beats because to me structure is character. So if mm -hmm. I can see where the character is, that character is creating the structure, and I can see the poles of the character and all the stuff that my brain needs to kind of understand that I have an engine for the story mm. um, and that we're not going to get to the midpoint and it's going to go poof, right. right? That that stuff I need. And then I'll go out and blast it out and we'll do it back and forth. And then sometimes we go, well, let's go back to the core and let's chart it again and again yeah. because each time you go out, you find something, which is something that I was working with John as an, he was an actor and I was coming from development as a producer. I was like, my brain would always be like, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. I could go, and he would, I don't know, like, Man, kind of like, it's a cul-de-sac, John. That idea is a cul-de-sac. <laughs> and he, one day he was like, Beck, let's go down the cul-de-sac. We might find something really good and bring it back. Wow. And he taught me to play because my development brain and producer brain was so developed that I couldn't play. Mm -hmm. But what you really had to play at Pixar, just yeah. a lot of play, just a lot of what if, how about? And that part of that writer in me would be like, what if we do that, this whole thing falls down. And, and Pete, we, we, we go, okay, but today we're gonna try, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it, whatever needs to come back in, we'll come back in, right? Yeah. But so that, it's kind of trying to get those both halves of our brain. Yeah. So we play sometimes, and then sometimes we go back to the, okay, yeah. what is the construction of this? When I get nervous or overstimulated, I make a weird joke. <laughs> That's part of our process too. I think Meg knows that. I'll be like, "What if it's just clowns? <laughs> All clowns?" She's she, okay. okay let's, we'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow. <laughs> or we just joke around, right? We joke around, and then we might actually find something in right. there. It's not clowns, though. Just so you know. <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> not I yet. Mean, I mean, clowns. we'll see tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I love that. That's really valuable. What? How do you guys settle disagreements? I don't think we've had one yet. I mean, because we each write on our own, and we each have our own projects going, mm -hmm. and we, we decide which projects we're going to come together, and so we've kind of already talked about. I think if there's something we disagree with, it comes down to, this doesn't feel authentic to me, mm. right? That's how we're communicating that. Like, this doesn't feel real. I don't feel like she'd say that, or... or which, it has to feel authentic to both of us. Yeah. That's absolutely. fair. It's a good litmus test. Yes. Cool. I just, um, it's so fun for me to sort of see the inside of the process of a writing partnership. So um, now I know you can't say much, Meg, so feel free to dismiss this question, but we have so many superhero fans. You are billed as a writer on Captain Marvel. I know you were early stages, even just entering the terrain of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. What's that like? That's such a machine, I feel, on the outside. Uh, yeah, I was very early. It, it was really at this create a story stage, um, and then I left to go direct myself. So um, I don't even know what, if what I created is still in there. Fair and enough. there's a lot of what, amazing female writers that came after me. Um, so I'm excited for them. Um, Mar I, it, Marvel was fun. It was really fun. I got to read the whole canon with her to really dig into her. And um, it's it felt like Pixar in terms of just an incredibly collaborative, creative space mm -hmm. um, in terms of that. Um, they're very busy. 
Right. They make a lot of movies. <laughs> they sure do. Um, but again, because we were so early, right? I didn't. We we were just digging things up and throwing things out and trying to fig- find a shape for her. Mm-hmm. And that was based on the canon you had been reading. Yeah, of course. You have to okay. know where it's coming from. So, do you feel like you're entering a specific section of the canon, or sort of using the entire canon to develop the character? Well, like I would do with any existing character, you have to read everything mm-hmm. because that's and they know the canon so well. Right. I just have to catch up. Yeah. For, for me, um, but uh, yeah. I can't tell you anything. That's fair. I understand. Yeah, Marvel's very... Like, literally, men will drop from the ceiling. I like I just... <laughs> Well, I appreciate you at least wetting our appetite with what you can say. And well, I know our fans are very excited about it. And obviously, Allison Brie's amazing. So, um, good stuff to look forward to. And if you guys are comic book fans, know that we do have a comic book show called Marvel Movie News. And they will be talking about Captain Marvel a lot in the next year. So, we're excited. And congratulations on that. Um, finally, I'd love to ask... Anything, I know you guys have to be dodgy, but anything you can promote, would like to promote, this is the time that you're allowed to do that. But I know you got to be a little tight-lipped. I, uh, I'm writing a, an animated movie with Cartoon Saloon, who did Secret of the Kells and Song of the Sea, and they just got nominated for Breadwinner, and I'm really excited about that. I get to go to Ireland, I hope. And Great. Hang out, meet those Irish storyboard artists. Um, and that's with Nora directing, so I'm really excited about that, and that's for Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we just... Um, set up a TV show, but we're not allowed to talk about it yet because it hasn't been announced. But we yeah. set up a TV show together, and uh, we are we have an office at the producer's company, and sometimes the assistant <laughs> will walk down, and she'll be like, you guys are just laughing all day long. And we're like, we know, because this is so fun. That's we're really just fun. really having fun. Oh, that's yeah. great. Well, when that gets announced, we'll make sure to push it on this show okay, on your guys' you. behalf, and it's yeah. very exciting stuff. So last thing... A lot of young writers are just always asking for advice, and I know we've gotten a lot of amazing advice during this interview, but any little minute nugget takeaways that you offer to new writers? You know, you hear the question, how do I make it all the time? I don't know if that's something. How do I break in is one you always hear. What do you guys think? Uh, For me, it was uh, calling myself a writer, right? I'm a writer, And, um, and believing it and then telling other people and tricking everyone into <laughs> believing that I'm a writer. <laughs> you sound very I create, confident. I create, you You have to create your own narrative, right? Yeah. Like owning your own life. Like I'm telling the story and be very clear about you want what you want, right? Um, I'm building an empire. I'm gonna have live action shows and movies and animated projects, right? So I know what my future is. I, I don't quite know how I'm gonna get there, right? But sort of be clear about what you want and, ha- and who you are. Yeah, being clear about what you want is really essential, um, and it also helps you be a better writer because those your main characters better have very strong wants, mm. and often women are not enculturated to know even what a want feels like. Wow! Because we're so enculturated to service and make sure everybody else is happy. So for young female writers, I think you have to start really doing a deep dive into what does a want feel like and what do you want, not because of what other people want for you or because of what you should want, but what do you really, really want. And go big. And go big and, and dream big because, yeah, it might take you 10 years and you're going to go sideways, upside down, backwards and have a lot and have some failures and disappointments, but that is, that's, that's normal. That's very, very normal. Um, and it's the people who stand up again who stay in the game that make it. It's mm-hmm. literally sometimes not about the talent size. It's about endurance and desire, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, do have your tribe so that when those low moments come, the people can gather around you. You know, when I decided I wanted to be a writer, everybody thought I was crazy. Um, but I had a tribe of women who all came around me and they were like, just do it, just do it. And they read the first scripts and were like, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, like, and they were there on the hard days, and they were there the day I, you know, got took a picture with my WGA card, and they were there. They came the morning of the Oscar party, wow, to see me off, and it was a very long trail. But you know, have your tribe to kind of keep you boosted, and know that the fear doesn't go away, right? You have to do it. I feel the fear and do it anyway, right? But um, being afraid that it's going to be bad. And that's not an excuse not to do it because even that bad thing you lay down could be something that someone will respond to in some unexpected way or will trigger some other inspiring thing to do for the next step. But that's something I struggle with every day. Like, oh God, I'm going to disappoint everyone. They're going to find out the truth about me, that it's not good, you know. But uh, you just. That's normal chatter. Yeah. 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 Listen, it's going to be bad. (laughs) It is. A first draft, in my opinion, is everything that doesn't work. That's what a first draft is. Mm. Find. The small little lights in there, you know, what inspired, what kind of worked, and rebuild it. So 
yeah, you just have to have that mindset. In, in 64 shows of interviewing writers, not a single writer has said they liked their first draft, which is such an important takeaway. I think <laughs> with new writers, they put it on paper, and of course there's stuff you like in it, but they're seeing what's not working and they quit. And I've heard the expression puke draft or vomit draft used on 10 separate occasions. I don't know if this is even in the writer's canon, but it does feel like a motif. So <laughs> that's, funny. that's my takeaway is just remember, guys, like this first draft, Pull, focus on what you love about it and then dig into that. I mean, the first draft, you might have the wrong main character. Right. You don't even know what world you're in. I mean, it's literally just a dream. It's a raw piece of, 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 of soil coming out. And you, you know, I mean, how many drafts do you write at Pixar? I mean, you know, a lot. 15 drafts, right? Before it's ever going to go out a live action movie to cast. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's just that writing is rewriting. You've heard that before, but have you done it? You know, and I write like, and I know some writers can only write one thing at a time, and that's fair. But you should have a little idea pot always going. Yeah. Right. Because sometimes I meet young writers, and they're like, "This is my script," and I'm like, "Great. What else?" Right. First of all, no one can even rep you because they don't they can't read more than one. What are they selling? You know, I mean, there's so many reasons to have multiple scripts, but also just for your own development, mm -hmm. right? Because maybe this idea you've bitten off, you're not a good enough writer yet to write it. But that doesn't mean it's not a good idea. It just means it's really high math. Like, it's super hard for even the best writer. So write the next thing and the next thing, and maybe you'll come back to that. Right. right? Um, but, you know, it's easier to have the dream to be a writer than to actually do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were talking about this, about having the dream and then... The problem with going for the dream is what if you fail and then you've lost. Then you've lost the dream. When I first uh, met Meg, she, we were at lunch and she asked me, she's like, what's your story? What are you? And I said, well, I used to be a writer. Mm. And she was like, how dare you? <gasps> you know, so she sort of, uh, so I had to rethink that, right? Because I, I worked at Pixar. I was, it was nice and secure and I was having a great time, but I'd sort of given up the dream. So I jumped, right? I moved to LA, knew four people. And um, I'm trying to make it happen, making it happen. But yeah, what if you do it and it's just not for you? And then what do you have? Sometimes it's easier to sit back and like fantasize about what it's going to be like mm. instead of doing it. Do you think pulling the romance out of the capital W Hollywood writer is sort of an important thing, important work for writers to do? Well, it will just happen if you do it. Because, <laughs> it's true. I mean, <laughs> it's hard work, yeah. right? And it takes a lot of uh, uh, vulnerability, right? Listen, there are good times. I got to go Oscar dress shopping. There are good times. I'm not saying that stuff doesn't happen. <laughs> right. Right? But the day after the Oscars, I have to go sit back down and be like, oh, this script doesn't work at all. Right. Or whatever. You just go back to regular life. But I'm a story junkie. So even when I feel like people are killing me with their notes or I have to take a break because I'm, it's just too hard, I never, whatever's happening, my brain is always kind of like, but how do I make that work? Mm -hmm. Because I just know, I just can feel it, but I just can't get it. Like I get kind of a dog with a bone about it too, yeah. right? So that li little drive is always kind of chugging along. And that's the thing, right? When you think about the joy of writing, it's not going to the Oscars. It's that moment you have in the room when you unlock the puzzle, oh, right? so great. That yeah. is nothing better. Yeah. And you know what I will say to people who say they have writer's block or they can't do it or whatever, your excuses. Um, if you don't write that character, that is a gift from the writer gods coming down to you, that character will never exist. Hmm. That's true. They've chosen you, and you aren't doing the work. You are not sitting down to offer them a place to come out into the world and be seen and heard and tell their story. So they never will come. Hmm. You have a responsibility, in my opinion. Absolutely. Well, I couldn't have said it better, and I can't thank you two enough for coming on the show today. We're so excited about what we can't talk about. <laughs> um, but we'll be keeping our eyes and ears peeled, and anytime you guys would like to come back, we'd love it. And this has just been so much fun. If this is your guys' first time tuning into this show, this is a show called The Unproduced Table Read. Normally, we're reading work on air with a group of actors um, and the writer in the room, and we'll read it on air and kind of pick it apart and discuss what we've read. Um, it's a very missional show and we're dedicated to getting good writing heard and made so tune in if this is your first time checking out our show we have a podcast we have a catalog of 64 amazing scripts we have comedy drama sci-fi soaps animated we have everything anything you'd like to see so check that out in our catalog my name is jeff graham if you guys are interested i'm hosting an after show for facebook Watch's new show called sorry for your loss starring elizabeth olsen it is wonderful. I'm, not many people are watching it, but it's directed by James Ponsolt, who did The Spectacular Now and The End of the Tour. And it's this amazing hidden gem on Facebook that's great. So check out Sorry for Your Loss. 
and Meg and Lorian, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. This was so much fun. Guys, this has been the Unproduced Table Read. We will be back in a couple weeks with a brand new script, so we'll see you then. Thank you. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.